Cool on the pressure. What? Cool on the pressure. <laughs> Why? What happened? Um, it's just well, let me. Uh, it's just. We will give it uh, another ten minutes. Talk to you if you really fall asleep from boredom. Uh, we're both very passionate about this. We've been doing this for a number of years and uh, find a noble calling in, in fire protection and fire life safety. So um, uh, right off the bat, welcome in. Uh, right off the bat, um, if you all just want to be rather informal, I'm okay with that. It's complex with remote dial-ins and a room full of people, so you can also tune us up and push us forward. Uh, but if you all want to pause and you want to throw questions up, we'll do that. So, uh, please uh, feel free. We can be informal here, right? Um, we're, we like that. We're fire protection guys. Um, Brett and I are both NYSE uh, certified technicians. I got a hat to Brett. Uh, Brett's a level three fire uh, wet, wet system guy. I'm a level two. I'm working on my level three. He's inspired me. Uh, but if you have technical questions after we pass out our business cards, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, this is what we love doing. So there is no dumb questions in this world. Um, just kind of as we review, uh, as we review uh, our agenda today, we're going to really focus on uh, inspection, tests, and maintenance. We want to really dig into the why behind it. Uh, I think a lot of folks focus on frequency when we're having to answer those questions. But it's also important to understand why we're doing this stuff and then discuss scope and purpose. We really spend a lot of time defining terms and, and, and good definitions as inspectors, words mean things to us, and we want to provide valuable solutions. So uh, we want to make sure we're on the right path. We'll get through some standard definitions. Uh, we'll have a chance to talk about some deficiencies, probably a popular subject when it comes to sprinkler write-ups and other items you guys see a lot of. Uh, you may have some questions uh, about things you're seeing currently in the field. And then if we get to it, we have the time, we've, we can expand on system integration uh, in the fire alarm side, specialty systems, special application, special mode, and then uh, again, finish up with specialty systems in the Q&A. All right, look forward, awesome. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I guess the biggest thing is, is why do we do what we do? Um, first, fire light safety. It's, you know, a lot of people, you know, get into the routine and rub everything of all this to do, this to do, but they don't get why we're doing it. Light safety is very important. Um, we do these inspections to meet city code, uh, Phoenix. We base a lot of our stuff off of scenic Phoenix because once Phoenix adopts it, usually the rest of the jurisdiction will follow. Um, so here you can see we've got a couple of things directly from CD Phoenix. Um, they require frequencies, uh, what we test, what we inspect. They require that we have qualified contractors perform the inspections. And uh, so the biggest thing though is even though we provide these inspections, it falls on the owner or the representative who's maintaining that utility to perform those requirements, making sure everything's up to date. So uh, another key important thing is that fire protection systems normally operate in a standby mode. So when we come out to test, we put them in their emergency condition. We are testing those functions. So there's a common, well, work until you guys touch it, you broke it and fix it. And it's like, well, when it's in standby mode, it's just sitting there. So you don't want these failures to happen in the event of an emergency. So therefore we put them into those conditions to simulate it and make sure it's gonna work when you absolutely need it. So again, we just verify that the system, this equipment is gonna operate the way it's intended. Okay, that's a quicker scenario. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the two most common standards that we use is the NFPA 25. Everything we do for the sprinkler system, wet base, is all out of your NFPA 25. Fire extinguishers is going to be a different one, but your hydrants, standpipe connections, fire pump, uh, pre action, dry systems, all out of NFPA 25. Your NFPA 72 is going to cover all of your fire alarm and integrated services, your emergency function, voice evac, 
all I have is that. So here's just a couple examples. Um, wet risers. Uh, you have just your riser manifold up in the center, multiple risers feeding different systems, a standard single loan riser, uh, usually typically found in this building if you had sprinklers, would cover just that. So uh, to get a visual of it. Let's jump in. So uh, this little white paper report, again, to the Y. Um, sprinklers operated 93% of the time in fires in which they were present and uh, the fire was considered large enough to activate them. So just a graph, uh, why we use wet sprinklers and their effectiveness. Um, systems shut off, so in the pie chart, you're gonna see reasons why systems didn't work. Uh, commonly valves are shut off, water's impaired, uh, inappropriate system, smaller, lack of maintenance is in there. And I just kind of come back on the maintenance issue. We know that maintenance works. That's why we're all here. That's why we all have jobs. And I've got some of the cost of the system over the life of the system. That's why we're all here. Continually upkeep, maintenance, uh, and, and making sure these systems are functioning the way they're designed. Manual intervention. So commonly, and this sort of a, as you read the, the, the graph, it's going to buzz through here. We should be really concerned about shut off valves, uh, no power to fire alarm panels, or anything where the system is turned off. It should be our highest level of response uh, from you through the fire protection contract and with NHJ to resolve that quickly because you have an unprotected building and people are inside of it. Fire protection systems provide the opportunity for us to enjoy the occupancies that we do currently. So maintaining them, keeping them alive is uh, a bad, bad choice of words. Keeping them turned on is uh, of the utmost importance. Again, just another illustration of effectiveness of uh, fire sprinklers, effective in controlling fires 96% of the time. So been around a while, they do their job, but we've got to keep them up and running. Uh, that's why we're talking. I just want to add something to this. So our, the NFPA 25 is strictly test and inspect. We're not providing design evaluations. So when we go in, we're not looking for design defects, install defects. We're limited to the scope of what's been installed, approved, accepted in the service from the AHJ. So the design evaluation is something different. So uh, something you'll notice in here is uh, inappropriate system for type of fire, not enough water discharge. So especially if you guys oversee any warehouse type buildings or anything like that, it's common to have new tenants move in. They bring in new processes, new storage materials and stuff. That falls on the owner's responsibility to make sure that any hazard change or storage occupancies that have changed is meets the system that is there. So you don't install a fire sprinkler system in a light hazard space, which is typically an office. Gut it out and say, we're gonna store tires in here. That completely changes your hazard and storage. You definitely ain't gonna get enough water. That falls on the building owner or the designated representative. So depending on your contracts and how you guys are, uh, what you're contracted and responsible for, if you have an occupancy change, a new tenant moves out or moves out, moves in, moves out, whatever, it's a part of, it may be part of your guys' responsibility to make sure that the new fire protection system meets that demand of whoever just moved in. So, and that would be scare scenarios where there's not enough water or an inadequate system inappropriate for the design. I'd say just to add to that point, it's important to know that as of any fire protection contract, whether it's us or somebody else, you would expect, what does that look like? You would expect us to reach out to you and have a conversation, Here's some things we found. If it's out of scope, we want to identify that appropriately in a report, but we don't want to just glaze over those things. Hey, we noticed a new wall, there's no protection in the corridor, or you have to Brett's point, new storage, um, uh, a new commodity class in that building that the system's not going to protect. So you would expect us to identify that, call it out. We sometimes use concerned citizen reports or a supplemental report to discuss 
gaps in coverage and things of that nature. But what we really rely on is you to come to partner with us and come to some determination on how best to move forward. Again, limited in scope, the functionality, our report's gonna be really tight and specific to that, uh, but we should be discussing those other concerns, right? These are awesome. Uh, purpose of the standard, these are so basic, they're so rudimentary, but it's important that we touch on this stuff to understand why we're doing what we do. Uh, purpose of the standard, eliminate failures due to lack of maintenance. Pretty straightforward. These are all references straight out of NFPA. Again, you have our business card. When you see specific scenarios you want to address and get it drilled down on, give us a call. We love doing this stuff. We can root through the standard and find the exact uh, application we're looking for. Scope. So again, going back to what the scope, the cover systems that are installed according with generally accepted practices. Um, again, once the AHJ accepts them in, we don't override the AHJ. So it's been accepted in, we inspect off of that. Uh, again, the NFPAs are not intended to reveal installation flaws or code compliance evaluations. However, like Chris brought up, we can say, hey, we have a concerned citizen report. We have a separate report that we will fill out and bring it to your guys' attention. Um, we don't turn a blind eye to stuff. Um, but with our inspection reports, we stay within the inspection reports. So we use building reports. So if you guys are familiar with what the actual reports look like, we don't write up design flaws. You're not going to see installation flaws, any of those things. Uh, that would be a whole separate paperwork that will come and our technician should be talking with you and at least making you aware of certain situations before they even decide. So, so again, the purpose of doing it is ensuring a reasonable degree of protection for life and property. You know, again, it's not just we're out here because we want to sound the alarms and lay everybody looking forward to turning valves and get water everywhere. There's a reason why we're out there. There's a reason why the frequencies are repetitive sometimes. It's like, we get a lot saying, man, weren't you guys just here? <laughs> but there's a reason for it. The standard sets spe specified testing dates and frequencies. And again, it's because it's, it's protection for life and property. Well, let me offer a scenario. So we have this happen in the last couple of days. Um, we go out to a school, we're testing. Everything's monitored, everything's hit the panel, everything's dialing out, water flows, campers, full stations, smoke detectors. We get to an out mechanical building. All that's there is pumps, controllers. It's a support building. It's got a single riser. It was installed 10 years ago. Uh, it's wired to be locally monitored, uh, electric bell only. It's a school. We all know it should be monitored and dialing out and calling the fire department. Those are our kiddos. Right, we're trying to protect. Um, the reasonable approach was to reach out to the, the building representative, the, the I don't want to say the city, the city representative to say, we've identified this area of need, what do you want to do? So we should partner on those. We all suggested calling the fire department. He wasn't comfortable doing that, so we did. We left the name of the building and the address out of the conversation so we could have a neutral you know, sort of discussion and the city agreed it was green tagged as is, it's installed and inspected as is, it was functional. However, uh, it's a good idea to have that stuff monitored. So um, two approaches at that point you might see, you might say to me, hey Chris, or hey Brett, we want to see a valid report. I've got to drive the capital improvement budget to get this thing approved so we can add or fix, right? Um, in this case, uh, if they had another failure, somebody uh, up the food chain was probably going to pop. They asked us to pass it for functionality, which is appropriate to do, but to note it duly in the report so that they can mention it and get it into a future capital improvement budget. And we can add the monitoring. The SLC wires were there. It was a real easy fix. So a reasonable approach, reasonable discussion is what you should be getting out of us. Pre and post inspection interviews. I know you mentioned that too. Um, 
inspections defined. I think the goal of this is just to show between NFPA 25 and NFPA 72 that the standards are harmonizing. I like to use the dimmer switch analogy. As we learn, right, through mistakes and trial and error, the dimmer switch gets a little brighter every year. The standard realizes what it needs to do to adopt and change to modernize. It used to be that the water standard in the electronics and the fire alarm standard had no harmonizing going on at all. Uh, we, for example, on the water side, could uh, alarm in five minutes. It's absolutely preposterous to think uh, if I don't have a fire truck there in seven minutes, it's it's probably a big deal. Uh, but our code allowed us a five minute response time. Fire alarms were always within ninety seconds, right? So we'll hear we'll have that dialogue commonly forty five to ninety seconds. Everybody says, well, it's under ninety, right? As long as it's within the ninety seconds, we're good. We're getting an alarm. We're getting a response through monitoring, and the fire department's mobilizing. So the examples there are just. We show visual inspection in defining again. We want to define what we're doing out there because it matters a visual examination of your system. So when we're talking over the phone, it's good to have those terms and understand what they mean so that we're coloring the same page or the same book, right? So again, inspection, visual inspection, uh, visual examination, sorry, uh, looking for physical damage or conditions that impair operation. Again, you'll see impairment a lot uh, throughout what we do. It just means that your system is shut off. Testing, I'll just carry on. Um, testing defined uh, as a physical examination. I'm going to put hands on. I'm getting a ladder out. I'm um, testing something. I'm going to pull water. I'm going to hopefully not destroy your landscaping while we're doing it. And we're going to hopefully have adequate drainage. Uh, a uh, couple of smiles in here understanding what we're talking about. That drain's not going to be clogged. Uh, and we're going to be able to effectively test that system and get the data out of it that we need, right? Maintenance. Uh, is there anybody that doesn't understand maintenance? Um, it's. Um, you want to add anything there? I mean, it's pretty rudimentary, but you know, very self explanatory, but. Uh, picture of fire, uh, fire rising there, you know, maintenance, they're going to take those caps, they're going to flow it. So flowing is the actual testing. The maintenance portion is, you know, we lubricate the rubbers, we make sure the threads are good, that everything goes on, uh, making sure that it drains properly. If you have a wet barrel, it's going to stay wet. If it's a dry barrel, we're going to make sure it drains. Uh, so we're going to perform a little bit of maintenance. It's not just, we touched it. We tested it before the water walk away. There's a little bit more involved in it. Um, OSMYs or valve stems. Uh, once we test it, we operate it through a full range of motion, open it back up. However, that valve stem probably get lubricated. Fire department connections, those swivels got to move. Your inside poppers got to go. Uh, we lubricate those as needed, making sure that they're moving so that we perform some maintenance on those. Um, a sprinkler system, we're not going to drain your system, we're not going to pull it out and start doing your five year terminals, even though that is considered the maintenance of it. That's a whole different thing. Uh, the minor maintenance is what we'll take care of on second train. So, non critical deficiencies. So, again, this goes into start starting to, as you see reports and you start getting deficiencies in the reports. Um, NFPA classifies them to have a non-critical, critical, and uh, uh, impairment. So it kind of starts escalating, and it's going to, depending on what it is, it defines it as this needs attention, nah, this can wait, or this is impaired. Then Phoenix jumps in and says, okay, you got to do all this now. Um, so non-critical. So if you have a hydraulic power plate and you're not missing it, your sprinkler system is going to work. It's going to put out the fire or put water on the fire, give you time to get out. That's going to be considered. It is classified as a non critical. So it needs attention, but not immediate. Can so we hover on this just for a second? So, for starters, we're burning through this. Want to pause? Are we good on definitions? Is there any questions so far? We're good. Awesome. Um, anybody at home? Okay, awesome. 
Um, so back to deficiencies, and we got to calculate this. Let's talk about some scenarios with calculates. They have to be legible. We're in Arizona, and they're outside. They sunburn, and they're gone in like six months. So we prefer to engrave, at least if you engrave the data on there, we can recover that, even if all that paint is sun bleached off and it's gone. And the reason that's important is these things are really expensive. It's really critical uh, for the understanding and evaluation of that system and what it can do. It's not critical deficiency for us in functionality world. It's just non-critical like Brent's mentioned, but they can be costly if those are missing, if they've been stolen, ripped down, or we can't read them. A lot of times they're gonna suggest reverse engineering. Uh, it gets costly because now you're into a permitted process. You've got to get an engineer involved. We've got to run a reverse cop through your system. So understand they look uh, like a piece of, uh, it's a wallflower essentially, but it's really important and it needs to be there. So understand uh, if they fall off, don't just throw those in the waste basket. Um, you want to hold on to those and identify the area that they protect. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> So everyone's seen those. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, going into critical deficiencies. So when you look at the sprinkler heads in these pictures, gives you different scenarios. So again, when we talked about being reasonable. So you know, if you go by the definition of the book, if you're looking at a sprinkler head, all sprinklers shall be free of rust, corrosion, paint, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I look at it and I got little specks of paint on it, by book, it's a failure. Reasonable, that head's gonna go. To what degree though? So when you look at these pictures, what is considered a reasonable degree when it is gonna be considered a critical deficiency? So I gives the example here, uh, a single lightly painted sprinkler in a large warehouse might not be, or might be non-critical, and its risk for a single painted sprinkler in a battery charging station might be considered critical deficiency. So again, the book does give a little bit of leeway for the inspectors to make a judgment call. And if I have a large warehouse and I've got 20 other sprinkler heads, a light painted sprinkler head, you know, there's other ones that are going to go off, right? If it's the single head in this one room, if that head doesn't go off, what is it? So, um, and the reason why paint is so critical, if you look at your one to the far right, and it's completely painted, when it starts to fill in your deflector, that is your spray pattern. Your, your water droplets change, the, the way it's dispersed, the density of the water, everything changes on that. So even though you're like, the heat's gonna, the fire's gonna melt that, it's gonna go off. It changes your spray pattern. It completely changes the effectiveness of it. That is one of the reasons. If you look at the paint over the bulb, that insulates the bulb. It affects the response time. So instead of going off and it's a designated response time, you could add who knows how much time to it actually going off. That much time, the fire can get out of control real quick. So again, paint matters. The second to the right there. When you look at that, it's just on the seat of the sprinkler head. Well, once that ball pops and that's gone, that seat should come undone and it should let your water discharge. But that paint could actually act as glue and it will hold that seat in place and it'll never let your head pop. There's been times where we go through and do inspection and there's no bulb in the sprinkler head and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. someone got lucky there. But then when you start looking at it, you see it's either corroded or it's been painted and it's actually glued and sealed shut. <laughs> so whoever hit it with the ladder got lucky that it didn't blow and flood the place. <laughs> However, in a real case emergency, you have no water protection or no fire protection, your building is toast. So, uh, so this is examples of degrees uh, of why painted sprinkler heads, that's a common deficiency. You'll see a lot on your reports and why the inspectors will write them up. I want to draw into a couple of points there. And we mentioned a pyramid again. This is going to be a running theme, right? If it's shut off or it can't do its job, it's the highest level of response. We need to be immediate and moving things forward quickly, making contact with the fire department. Um, 
and a monitor in that reasonableness argument is a consideration of occupancy and hazard. How many times have we seen an office space converted to a storage room and I've got legal files packed floor to ceiling? Something I, if I have a fire in there, it's going to be a blazing inferno in three minutes flat. Where's the 18 inches? That's a great point. So, in typical laughter and the there's probably a lot of interest in sprinkler heads. So, let's talk about the 18 inch rule. Um, and I want to come back to harmonizing because I want to run with that. So, 18 inches is from the deflector to the top of your storage. Commonly, we'll see um, in a shoe barn or a shoe warehouse where those little boxes are just so easy that you've got a little more storage on the top rack. But if it's not 18 inches below that deflector, we're, we're going to consider that obstructed. Um, the rules have changed back to harmonizing. It used to be uh, surface mounted lights, other obstructions dangling down soffits were considered uh, obstructions. They've since removed those rules because we were wearing that engineer hat again. We were going into engineer mode as inspectors and we were making bad calls. So if you have concerns in unsprinkled areas or softened areas or obstructions that you might consider risky, right? When you look at it, it just doesn't make sense. Then let us know. We can come out with an engineer, evaluate that, see if there's anything appropriate that needs to happen. Keep in mind, as the spray pattern develops and why it's so important to keep those veins open is there's a parabolic that forms. So an umbrella, as you move farther away from the hazard, it creates clearance. Sorry about that. We're back. Online, both. Um, and as the standards have harmonized, um, so let me pause for a second, let me back up even further, because you had mentioned the, uh, the adopted standard, the adopted code. So right now, City of Phoenix, uh, where, the, where Phoenix goes, the valley follows. Uh, City of Phoenix IFC uh, has adopted 2017 as the water-based code with City of Phoenix amendments, 2019 with City of Phoenix amendments for the fire alarm code. Even though they adopt 2018 IFC and the National Fire Code, they went ahead and exceeded that standard and uh, issued an amendment for fire alarms, and we're in the 2019 edition. That being said, in the 2020 editions of water-based system test and inspect and FPA 25, the constituency has sent enough feedback to the committees that they're going to begin looking at what Brett's describing as a reasonable approach to minor overspray on heads. And they've run enough tests through UL and Factory Mutual to know with minor overspray, minor loading, the heads are going to operate as, as they uh, were designed. So uh, expect that change probably in the near future. Gives us a little more latitude because this is a hot button topic. Um, that one on the right is absolutely blasted and there's no chance, there's no snowball's chance in hell that's gonna work. So, but we had some laughter, so we should pause at home. If there's any questions about sprinkler head deficiencies or in the room, we can certainly take those now or we can keep them going. You good? All right, going easy on you. Um, Quiet room. Awesome. <laughs> Brett scared him on the way in. It's all his fault. <laughs> so, all right. So, an impairment. If we're on site and an inspector has to impair something, this is where things really start to escalate. Um, so, an impairment is defined as a condition for a fire protection system or unit or portion, therefore, or thereof is out of order, and the condition can result in the fire protection system unit not functioning in the event of a fire. So if we come in, they're doing construction on the street and they shut down an underground valve. We come in, we do a main drain test and all your pressure is gone because valves are shut underground. That is an immediate impairment that completely affects your sprinkler system's ability to do its job. It will not put water if it has no supply. So that is an impaired system. 
So, and I know we talk about it further down in the slides for discovery and definition, but when we get to impairments, that it, it's a uh, usually our inspectors will stop what they're doing. They will come find the building engineer or whoever the, the point of contact and say, hey, we got an issue. We need the remedy to this real quick. If we have any remedy, if you're in Phoenix, Phoenix has its whole procedure, notification, a uh, whole process that's got to be followed. We're going to encourage you a lot to contact the fire department, right? I yeah. mean, this is our partner in, in this world. So don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid. They're there to help. They're there to provide support. We're going to encourage you regularly to, to reach out and make contact with them. Um, there's certain things they'll be able to talk to you about as, a, as the owner or the owner's representative. They may not be comfortable talking to us about. Um, and there's a hang tag, right? We need to get the hang tags out there to identify what portion of the system is impaired. Um, these are funny pictures. Uh, these are silly things that we see a lot uh, when we're talking to people that you know, they call us subject matter experts uh, and we play that game, but it's important to understand what we're looking at so we can talk, at least if we're on the phone and, and have a conversation that's meaningful. I'm not seeing her in the top picture. I get it. Uh, it's basically gonna, you know, bug the heck out of the person sitting next to it, but it's not an alarm panel. I don't rely on these things. I don't trust them. Uh, they're supposed to function. We will test that, make sure they are functioning and we'll let you know when they don't. Uh, but we're going to hang out on that main FACP when we're testing fire alarm systems. Um, that has a role to play. It's a tool of convenience. It's just going to offer additional support if you want to have the capability outside of a control room to be able to silence and monitor your fire alarm system. Um, there's another thing we hear commonly. I'll hear enunciator versus FACP. Enunciator is not an FACP. It just beeps irritating. Uh, until you call and, and you need to get it fixed because it's going to be crazy. Uh, signal, uh, this is what I hear a lot as well. The difference between alarm and a supervisory and a trouble, these are three distinct signals. Not all panels are set up as a three or four zone panel. A lot of these AES dialers out there are two zone panels. I can get a fire alarm and a trouble signal only. So we'll have that discussion when we scan those devices that we're going to identify that as a trouble or a supervisory signal so you know what's supposed to be coming in there um so not to get it confused commonly we'll hear things like supervisory alarm and then we've got to try to dig through that conversation and figure out what in the heck is your problem and what in the building not your problem personally that's not what i'm saying but what is going on in your building right uh, so is it a supervisory or is it an alarm? Well, those are important to know, especially if you're calling in for service, because we we interpret those very distinct. If you call in and say, I got an alarm on my panel, it's, oh, we need to roll a truck right now. You don't want to get the after hours charges. You don't need to get the after hours charges. If we get out there and it's a trouble signal, well, your panel was beep and it wasn't really an alarm. So it's important to know the differentiate between those signals. Save yourself some money, understand the importance. Red alarm, you got an issue. You need to, if you can't handle it, you don't know what it is, make that phone call. Supervisory signal, generally can wait for trouble, generally can wait for business hours. <coughs> Excuse me. Your supervisory, the one you might want to make a phone call on is if you get a supervisory for a fire pump running. If your fire pump turned on for a reason or no reason, whatever it's running for, that supervisory you definitely want to check out. Or a control valve is might be closed. Yeah, you might have an impairment as well. No, you have a cracked crack pipe under the street. Cracked pipe under the street. Uh, yeah, okay. just I dealt with that. It. Just dealt with that. We we yeah. dug up first avenue there and. Cleared and, and that cracked pipe came on on the weekend. We both, might not know the system, but you could call us. We have a 24 hour on call service. Oh, we it was out. a nightmare. It was a nightmare. We didn't have to pull in a, a booster uh, and that have to get a backup fire pumps that we would have had to tie in. But we had to rip up the, the street 
and replace it. And that happened in the last year. <laughs> we can provide support for temporary fire pumps. Uh, that's pretty common now. They're adopting new codes for City of Phoenix to address that. Um, there's some hazards involved with that. Obviously, it's not monitored uh, until we hook it up and yeah. you got to bypass whatever the brand is. Oh, yeah, is. the buildings couldn't, the, the 4,000 buildings couldn't be occupied. What was the cost? Old pipes. Old pipes. Old pipes. Yeah, from the 60s. We're, we're, we're down to our last one. All the other ones are, are dead in the water. <laughs> so we got no more to play with. Um, so then, so then it's going to be a big major project. That sounds major and expensive. It was. Yes. I just wanted to point out one thing, Please. Chris, uh, about the three city mills, guys. Uh, that's very, very important. I'm not just touched on that. Uh, me and Ryan put that as we're talking to you guys, and knowing the three different city mills, the alarm supervisor is in trouble because. You know, the building owner is going to pay for if they come out and it's just a trouble. I mean, that's going to look kind of goofy on our end, you know. So that's very, very important to know the three different signals. If it's a trouble and it's a battery and we call Brett, you know, that's going to get a little pricey. So, you know, just that you want to be aware of, you know. Thank you for that. Appreciate both of you guys. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, just kind of recapping during our test and inspecting what we're looking for. We're looking for any deficiency, anything that is going to have a potential negative impact to the performance of your systems. If it's going to affect how what it's supposed to do, what it's designed to do, we're going to write it up. You're going to have that deficiency. Um, a critical one again is going to affect the functional ability during an event. So remember. When we're there testing, we're testing in emergency settings, activating it, and not in a standby mode. So uh, we want to make sure it's going to work in the event of fire when you need it at most. I have a question. So if the enunciator is turned off, right? For whatever reason, it's beeping, it's turned off. Um, if there's like a compressor burnout and it smokes up the whole entire suite, do the horn strobes and alarm still go off? Yeah, they should go off. Yeah, the sure. Hank fire panel is still working. So your enunciator is, it's a, usually your fire, your main fire panels are in an electrical room, it's back. Your enunciators are up in the front, usually towards an entry or sitting at a, a security desk or something where it's visibly seen. So if that enunciator is not working, your main fire panel is still working. So if the smoke detector picks up smoke, it's still going to report to your fire panel. Your fire panel should see your enunciator not working, and you should have a trouble or something on your panel saying you got an issue with this thing. And what if it didn't do any of that? If it didn't do any of that? Yeah. Yeah, well, that was me last week. I was working on an AC unit, and the compressor started to burn out. I started to smell refrigerant on the roof, so I went down to the suite. And there was a bunch of smoke coming out. And I was like, why, why isn't the fire alarm going off? So so then I was like, shit, I ran, I ran upstairs and I shut the disconnect off. And then I went back down and I started making sure that there was no fire or anything like that. The alarm never went off. It could be that smoke alarms work through obscuration and they're only going to come in at a specific level where the smoke part particulates in the air obscure the beam and the detector to set it off. So it's possible that it didn't reach that level of obscuration okay. enough to set off the alarm. Uh, you got out a lucky thread because yeah. you know, <laughs> standing, you know, a lot angry um, and frustrated. But um, enunciator, again, to Brett's point, is uh, an ancillary device. Uh, it's not a main functional piece. It's just a, a, a connected, exterior connected piece of, for convenience. Oh, okay. And depending on what room it was, you may have had a heat detector in oh, that room. So okay. until it got hot enough, it would have never activated the heat. So I got so, yeah, I just want to do that. Like, you know, he was saying that his compressor stuff burned up, right? Wouldn't he want to do the duct work? And then is it in the code to have duct detectors? It depends if they're it depends it's on well, it could be grandfathered in. Yeah, yeah. So so sometimes you have duct detectors. Yeah. Sometimes you have duct detectors that are really bad. Stand alone with the B though. 
and sometimes they actually tie into the fire tunnel. So again, there's a lot of different scenarios there and what building you're in. And if it was, if it was the compressor and it's sitting outside of the air condition and didn't get into the actual flow to where it would hit the sensing line, then it might not have picked it up. I just, I want to come back to your question, but um, I would also start with my building reports, my inspection reports, do a quick investigation. Do you have an area over there that's had a history of troubles, deficiencies, things like that? It's possible something's not functioning. You're exhausting every reasonable effort to make sure the system works right as it was designed. You're being an inspector essentially. But if you have a truly, you know, if it's truly a concern, um, we'd be glad to come out and take a look at it and troubleshoot it as well. Okay, um, please. So my question is, I have a building with three tenants. They're all on the fire panel, yet the one tenant has an enunciator in their suite, which is connected to our fire panel. And I'm just trying to figure out why that tenant has an enunciator. Do you think the city, instead of making them put a fire panel in, they made them just put the enunciator in to connect to the panel for the tenant's building? Is it all us or this question? Is it all under the same address? Yes. <laughs> that's why. That's why. Because at City Square, you want to job with them? <laughs> where you're part of yourself. It's, 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 he does it every time. So it's fine. We we had a hotel that that's attached to our four thousand building. Now it's a freestanding building. They have a fire panel, but they don't have a separate address, so it's considered as one. So when their panel goes off and they have a separate, we have Metro, they have Summit. Their sends it because it's still by city code, it's tied into my my high rise building, although they're a separate entity from us now. We don't own that part of the building. It's and in a third, so it's tied together because that's the way by code it had to be because it's all under the same address and it will show problems and anything that happens in that other Which building on your panel. Right. And City Square is a really complex setup there because of the age of the buildings, right? But oh. maybe too, and, and another thought to add to what you're saying, I uh, really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to add to that is sometimes what we're calling an enunciator, there's sometimes could be a security or a bird panel, just a very low functioning system that um, that's as good as it gets. That's all they require at the time they install. And those look similar to enunciators. They're just small keypads. They might say bay alarm or um, what are some bird systems we see? Draw a blank spot, but it could be a bird system. I was told it was an enunciator panel. Okay. So I was just curious as to why. I just thought maybe because they were part of the same building as the other two tenants when they did their build out. I was wondering if maybe the city said, well, you can get away with putting an enunciator in and using it. It's a plan of fitness. That's interesting. Isn't it interesting because. Yeah. They were having a situation at the building where I have a TI going on, and of course, it's in their enunciators and supervisory mode because I'm doing TI work with Dr. Peck. And I don't know the age of the building, but a lot of those, especially the Berg style, we started to abandon when we started to install AES radios and remote dialers because they have some low level functionality in them that exceeds what those things are capable of. Even though they're twos on panels commonly, I can run 10 points through there, which is generally enough where the fire alarm might only be monitoring that fire riser, you know, on flow or on tamper or something like this. You know, um, if you want to dig into that further, we can certainly do that. Uh, if you have further questions, um, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Another scenario with that is if they build a shell and when they install it, Fred said install it over here, fire panels over here. Right. And then when they build out each of the individual suites, now there's walls up and your fire panels here and your enunciators over there. Yes, when they, they so, did the build out, I think it used to be a grocery store. So there's one big building and then yeah. they took it and it into three spaces. Yeah, so. that would be a reason. 
Uh, again, a permanence condition where we're shut off or out of order. Uh, there's two types emergency and pre planned. Uh, we should have that discussion with you all that uh, if you're dealing with impairments, which I believe we probably all are at some level, mm -hmm. uh, in emergency and pre planned, you should think about assigning a period of four years, especially for larger sites. Uh, where there's a lot of people, right? There's a high rise, there's a lot of people just building. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, if you're going to have a uh, pre planned impairment, uh, it's good so that you can communicate well with the fire department, every, everybody in the building. Emergencies are pretty self explanatory, so it's shut off and we've got to mobilize quickly. Uh, impairment hang tags, property owner or designated representative shall assign an impairment coordinator. There it is. If you want to dig deeper on that, Please again reach out, let us know. NFP is really uh, detailed in that area. It gives a model to how to write a plan. Of course, as an outline, you may just decide to exceed that standard or communicate differently. As long as the minimum of that outline of that standard is met, then you're in compliance. Uh, City of Phoenix um, uh, offers, I think we get into that a little bit. Somebody pause. I think we talked about City of Phoenix a little bit here in a sec. Um, we're going to stick to the slide. The absence of a specific designee, the property owner, or designated rep shall be considered the impairment coordinator. So it defaults, uh, and it, all that simply saying is whether you assign somebody or not, whether you're sophisticated enough to have that plan in place or to have that idea before you get to that emergency or that shutdown, by default, uh, you are the desi designated person. Um, so it's better to plan ahead, right? I think that's what's the same to us. But again, there's that point tag. We don't see that a lot. Uh, every jurisdiction in town requires hang tags, and it's kind of a goofy thing. Um, hang tags are ancillary, I guess, for lack of a better term, when we talk about remote panels being the ancillary sort of hang tags. The report's what matters. Uh, it's a tool of convenience, but they are important. They should be there. Uh, if the fire department rolls, does a private visit, a walkthrough, an inspection, and they're not there, they're going to write that up. And they're going to ask you to start providing those inspection reports. And they're going to get a compliance engine here in a sec. Um, they have 100% view now, and there's no way around it. Your favorite. <laughs> Yeah. So dampers is not required on our testing. So when we come in and we start testing all of your duct detectors and it closes your dampers, making sure that those dampers close is not in the scope of NFPA 72. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's often uh thought of as it's included, but it's not. So uh, NFPA 72, again, which was requiring your duct detectors, your testing of all of those. Um, Let me jump on. So we subcontract. So you say it's out of scope. We test for signaling and monitoring. They got smoke heads attached to them. We'll come in, we'll test those devices. Do they signal the panel? Do they dial out? That's the end of our responsibility. If you have in, you know, uh, remedy or other medical facilities, they may have a higher standard level that needs to be met, joint commission or otherwise, and they want to verify the function of that smoke detector, we can say in a device, in VR, we use building reports, the functionality is to shut the fire smoke damper, but we're not going to verify that functionality. So we cross-discipline, uh, we'll coordinate cross-discipline support. We use prevent to come out. Yes, I can see the louvers close. Yes, I can hear the motor whir. And yes, I don't know what that means. I can't confirm it. I'm not qualified. I'm not trained. So we get them out there. They put their, uh, you know, their air monitoring machines to make sure that the louvers are actually closed and they're shutting down. Is that good? Good. Cool. Oh, uh, there's also uh, standalone piezo operated. We'll just steer clear of those. Don't call us. Just if you need a contractor, we'll hook you up with a preventer or somebody else. 
if they're locally monitored at the fire smoke damper, there's no connectivity to the fire alarm panel and uh, save the money, call somebody else. Um, usually it's just got a light piece of it buzzes. It's just more of an irritant that tells you it's closed and it's been activated or it's clogged and it's dirty. Um, just a little more clarifying. I know this is your favorite subject. I know you saw that. You know, um, uh, red wire uh, to the fire alarm panel. So those of you who put head above ceiling, usually you'll see that low voltage red wire. It's indicative that it's tied into the fire alarm panel. Well, not always, but most of the time that is tied in. It needs to be tested. We've got a confirmed signaling in the panel. And then again, the standalone piezo, it's just an irritating little buzz. We can hook you up with a mechanical contractor if you don't already have one that come out before that test. For cross zoning, um, emergency control functionality. This is elevators, so let's just carry on a little bit. Fire alarm systems are the central point where we're integrating building systems now, mechanical, elevators, right? And right now like we're rewriting our elevator policy because there's a big safety hazard when we go up into shafts, right? Fall protection, confined space. Uh, just know that these are outside of our scope as we start to look at NFP 72 fire alarm systems, chapter 14, these are outside the scope. We can support that test. Usually you'll hear from our coordinators or somebody who's scheduling, they'll say, can we get an ANSI uh, qualified elevator tech on site? You guys, you know, uh, uh, pick up the cost, send the ANSI, the, uh, ANSI guy out. He tests his shunt trip, his uh, primary secondary recall. Uh, just know that anything that's a secondary functions out of our scope and we'll need support while we're there. There's elevator coordination. Let's go. So specialty system integration. How's that? Okay. So definitely a lot of the time when we come in, uh, most commonly you're going to have a pre action system inside of the server room. You're going to have your your Halon FF two hundred. Um, so when outside of the contractor and we come out, often what's missed from our point of contact is access. Uh, a lot of times we'll need special access. Uh, IT department needs to be there to get us in. Um, one of the biggest things is to have an EPO, the emergency power off. Uh, there's nothing worse than testing, not knowing there's an EPO on the system and it, kill, <laughs> and it killing the entire server room. And next thing you know, Amazon is shut down because you killed their server room for the whole Western United States. That's a lot of money, a lot of unhappy people <laughs> and high minute money. And so those are the kinds of things that can really get into trouble uh, real quick. So when we come in, there's ways that we can try and identify it, um, but it's not always foolproof. There's always relays, there's hidden stuff. So. It's really important when we're getting into access to these server rooms, we know what's going on in there. So it's important to have the as built drawings. Um, please don't laugh when I say as built drawings. <laughs> but if you have them, they're certainly helpful. Uh, we can Mario Brother pipe and chase wire uh, at a cost. So it's good to hold on to those so you can find them. For time, we got two minutes. Uh, there's two slides at the end, super important. When I get to, are we okay to continue? Do we want possible questions? How are we going to just want to check in? So, if you have to leave, I'd say it's okay. Uh, we all have families often, but you guys are more than welcome to continue uh, the rest of the presentation if you like. So, Fantastic. it's up to you guys. Uh, that's awesome. So nobody stood up, so we must be doing a halfway decent. <laughs> but if you have questions at home, please submit them. And Jennifer will get those to us. Anybody in the room, please uh, don't hesitate to jump in. Uh, this also works through system integration uh, in server rooms and specialty rooms. You'll commonly see pre-action, which is our A-grade uh, water-based system uh, in concert with clean agents, FM200s, halons, and things like that. Um, access. Is always a problem. Right? 
Um, but those system integrations, we do work through. And it's important that those systems talk and they operate in sequence and we're not accidentally shutting down reverts. And, and uh, if I don't get my cat food for them, it's a long time. Uh, <laughs> So, all right, so again, three actions. Most commonly, they're going to be found in your data rooms, uh, or in the hospital areas with MRI rooms, uh, and areas that are subject to freezing. More commonly, it's going to be a dry system, but you can see a, a free action protecting a, a, an area subject to freezing. I always laugh at freezing in Arizona because it's, it's the other side of the team, but where storage warehouses, uh, uh, freezers, coolers, uh, Kroger, uh, Safeway, things of that nature. We do see that quite a bit. Um, freeze protection. What are the additional inspections on a reaction compared to what type? Twenty percent. Great question. Oh. Wanna... Yeah. So on pre actions, your trim line is going to because they have restricted orifices, filters. Uh, those are going to be required to be taken apart on a five-year basis. Uh, because it's being monitored by air or nitrogen, you're going to have a uh, three-year low air leak test that's going to be required. You still have your five-year internal pipe requirements, the five-year internal pipe assessment. Your actual valve itself is going to be required to be pulled apart. Um, different manufacturers have different requirements, like uh, your Tyco DB5s. Manufacturer says they recommend that the rubber kit be completely replaced every 10 years. Um, so, quarterly low air, yep. uh, semi annual uh, flow and tamper. Uh, low air, your low air supervisor switch is going to get tested. Um, compressor maintenance. Um, we just sat through uh, air. I keep saying fun a lot right now. It's a free action. It's his wheelhouse. But uh, there it is again. We sat through, uh, what was it, air, national air, and they were uh, getting general air. General air yeah. And they're getting their hangs back for failing to compress and fill mm -hmm. systems in that 30 minute mark. They'll commonly dump out gallons of water. He said, so it was interesting to me that there's a little valve down there, a little spit valve, if anybody played trumpet or brass, there's a little spit valve down there where you can bleed condensation out of the tank. They're glad to send you a replacement because they're making a fortune on it, but it's funny to them because through regular maintenance on a quarterly, I can pull that spit valve and bleed the condensation out. And I think that was pretty interesting. Does that answer your question, Mark? Yeah, thank you. Backflow, fire line backflow, we'll go through a quick series of backflows. The arrows look like they're going the wrong direction. It's to hold the water from going back. We service backflows as well. We uh, maintenance, repair, replace. We've got underground division uh, if you have those underground leaks. And we do have temporary fire pumps. Or city spread folks yeah, mm -hmm. lines installed in 1960. That was fire line larger. You'll see those at the curb commonly. Domestic water, the important note here is shutdowns are going to affect people, especially at restaurants, lunch, lunch lines, those types of systems. So be aware. Uh, toilets shut off, sink, uh, sink water shuts off. It's important to coordinate that when we come out, come and look out there at three or five in the morning and make sure you get those tests off to prevent any disruptions to service. And you'll see in the valley, a lot of those are being stolen for some insane reason. Yeah. 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 Still, it's, there's no redeeming value forever. They gotta be so desperate, right? Uh, but we see the cage right yeah. now. There's cages everywhere. Uh, I live in Gilbert. Gilbert uh, just passed an ordinance. They're gonna go to a 100% cage. I think next year as a requirement. So anybody with facilities in Gilbert, uh, there's going to be a cost impact, obviously, which will come with the cages and then your irrigation backflows, which seem like the most important ones to me, even though they seem inconsequential. I get these calls where people say, I had a $20,000 water bill last month. What happened? The first thing I say is, how's that irrigation line doing over there? And they'll start to investigate and realize that things has been leaking for years. Uh, cold chemicals can reach back through these lines. 
uh, pesticides, herbicides, plant food. These seem utterly important to me because I don't want to be drinking that stuff. I certainly don't want my family drinking it. Real small, usually tucked away in the bush, but they do serve an important purpose. And then just uh, depend on your location. If you get a transients through, uh, they might wash their hands. They'll they'll take the caps off. Um, if you start seeing dead spots in the landscape, and it's probably because they shut it off. If they're not caged up, they're usually in the bushes, usually accessible. Someone passing by, they can just close them. So there's something else to keep in mind. That's a public shower on 27th, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> True that, right? <laughs> The boulevard, <laughs> the trap, uh, fire pumps, diesel, electric, large amounts of water. Uh, we could probably wax on our fire pumps for about four hours and really bleed in tears. We're both passionate about them. Any questions about fire pumps? Yeah, Chris, can you explain to the guys what's the pump you're testing or we are testing on electric and a diesel fire pump? 100%. What, what, what should our engineers be doing? A lot. <laughs> um, so your electric is going to be once a month, 10 minutes. Your diesel is going to be once a week, 30 minutes. Um, your electric, a lot less, you got an electric motor, a lot less to look at. Um, but you're definitely going to be making sure your gauges are within proper range. Uh, when you start it up, uh, you're going to you do your pressure drop. You're going to hit your automatic starts. Uh, making sure it turns on correctly. It's going to register the pressure drop and turn on. Uh, you're going to look at the discharge, the suction pressure. You're going to make sure everything looks good. Uh, one of the most important things is you're going to look at your circulation relief valve because um, that's going to keep your pump from overheating. Make sure you have adequate water flowing out of there. Uh, while it's running, you're going to keep that on your packing glands, making sure that they are not getting hot what about and when it's not running? You're packing. Not running? It's a great question. You yeah. got Make sure it's supposed to drip. Yes. Yes. It is supposed to drip. <laughs> do, not, do not over tighten the packing yeah. and walk away with no drip. So, and this goes contrary to everything you're ever taught. You only adjust the packings when the motor's running. So, you're always told don't put your hands in the mold running. That's opposite with the fire pump. <laughs> While it's running, is when you adjust those packings. If it's not running and you tighten it down to no drip, you're fucking all up. You're, you're just messed up. You're, you're done. You're <laughs> burning your fat game. Yeah. Up. You're, you're totally so, down. So yes, always make that. sure you adjust while the pump is running, while that shaft is going, and you can watch your water discharge and how much is coming out. Um, me personally, I'd always rather see water, even if it's spitting out a little bit, versus tightening it down too much and it starts smoking and, and burn up on you. So there's no coming back. <laughs> so I'd rather see a little bit extra water, not excess where it's getting all over the floor and, and you got to put something over to contain it from spitting everywhere. That's too much, it needs adjusting. Um, but definitely I'd rather see more water than not. I'd say add batteries to that. Batteries yeah. are on a monthly maintenance, yeah. electrical systems on a monthly maintenance, and then uh, if you show up after a long weekend and you got an empty fuel tank, that thing ran on you all weekend. Then you got a problem. Um, you take your, you check your fuel level, you check your amp draws, you check your battery, amp draws, and and your battery voltages. You yes. check your water temps on 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 both sides. What your cooling for your fire pump is for the cooling system, and make sure water is going through that, that you don't have a solenoid closed. It's about a 30 you, point of diagnostic, right? You got a lot of questions yeah. answered there. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, then you check the, the regular, you know, temps of the motor, your oil temps. Um, that's any <laughs> diesel fire pump. If you have a diesel fire pump at your place, these are all things you can check on. So in NFPA 25, chapter eight covers your fire pumps. The oil and level, they, pull the dipstick. And then we've got your flow inspection checklist in there. Yeah.
Oh, he, he has about 15 checkpoints. There's there maybe more. There's there 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 uh, start asking questions. Most since the pipe is rated at 175 psi max, it's not that there isn't you know schedule 45, schedule 85 buffer that will take more, especially in a high rise. That question. Uh, the higher you go, the more and more of a heartbeat you need. Uh, so you need probably an engineering evaluation to tell you if you lose 0.43 to infinity uh, pounds per foot of rise. So do the math. If you're three or four stories, you're going to be losing, well, gosh, four and a half, three, four foot, 40 foot, 20 PSI at the top of the building. So there's, you know, gravity is uh, detrimental to, to a little bit of water, 100%. Dry and wet barrel fire hydrants, probably you see in the valley, dry barrel. Was yeah. curious about that. But basically, they're more expensive because you can rebuild them. There's a lot more functionality, a lot more maintenance capabilities in a dry barrel. Wet barrels charged at the cap. You covered that earlier, so I don't really need to spend a lot of time there. Fire alarm control panels and AES radios. Uh, this is just a few examples of things you're going to see. Night attendant suites, notification, and upcoming kind of testing. There's no way to isolate audible appliances. Uh, we get this request a lot. I've got a multi suite building. I just want to test one suite. I don't want to test the rest. Generally, not possible. Uh, in some cases, we can work through that, but at a great expense to you because I've got to go run down all those NAC booster and support panels, and they're not always obvious, right? They're hidden above ceilings. And you don't really want to pull them back. Yeah, it starts to get complicated. <laughs> Uh, all of a sudden, we're into a lot of and uh, arc flash hazards and everything else. Uh, last account members and passwords are of paramount importance, and we need to be prepared ahead of the schedule of inspection. So, anything you all can do to help support that is just going to benefit uh, efficiently get through the inspection. Okay. And don't pass them on to the town. <laughs> Yay, we made it. So, we're at the finish line. We got two slides that are super important. I love covering this stuff because I was getting my head handed to me three years ago when they rolled this out and they didn't tell anybody. Uh, Commonly, I get the call and say, hey, why did you throw us under the bus? We've been a 40 year client of yours. And now the fire department knows all my deficiencies and all my soft undersides. And I said, well, wait a second. Uh, this was an adopted uh, uh, through city ordinance. And for in order for us to hold the city business license, we have to comply as well. Compliance engine Bricer needs 100% of the reports are going up, and the fire department has full visibility now. There's a couple of nuances to this. Uh, I think their, their cells, and I think we can probably see value in that, is they're able to repair and maintain more properties. There's a, a certain a situation that happened. I saw the 10 o'clock news one night where a high school football player, 20 years after he graduated, was throwing babies off of the balcony. As they investigated, this facility in North Phoenix had a uh, history of fires and burnouts. Here was his family stuck and he was doing a rescue job. Uh, so without compliance, and what I'm trying to get at is facilities like that, buildings like that were slipping through the cracks. As we know, fire departments are commonly on the budget and understaffed. They weren't able to map their zip code, right? The compliance engine, that was the Excel pitch that came and said, we'll map your zip code for you. $35. Now all your reports go uh, to the fire department. That being said, there is letters available that kind of explains all that. We can help you navigate that. Almost everybody is on it now. Not everybody's there, but it's pretty close. There's a list and, and the fee schedule changes from city to city. When a deficiency report, this is important, right? Uh, talk about that a bit? When a deficiency report is issued, a copy sent. This is off City of Phoenix's website. The corrections haven't been made within 30 days. So what that looks like to you is you'll get a letter, 30 day notice. 
if I'm in the RFP program, so downtown, right? If I'm in the RFP with City of Phoenix, I can ask for an extension. Now, the fire marshal is not going to come down and tell you that because they're passionate about their business. They want to get these things repaired because they're overwhelmed, understaffed, they're trying to check the box and move forward. If you ask and you're in the RFP, they'll give you, I think, up to 90 days to remedy the deficiency, which commonly we need. Unless we started our inspection process two months early, by the time you get a quote, you're already behind. If you apply and $125 fee attached to it, they'll give you up to nine months. They won't tell you that unless you call and ask. So when you get the 30 day notice, you definitely want to take note and start to move things forward quickly because they're not messing around. They want to get these things remedied because you're again protecting life and property. <clears throat> yeah, a, a lot of a lot of what this you know another reason why this came to effect is is to weed out the ones that are trying to skirt the system, trying the gross negligence for life safety. They don't care. They just want a tag. Give me a tag so I can be compliant and move on. And that's not what we're about as a company or anything. So the compliance engine is a part of that too. Uh, people who are trying to do as minimum and just uh, flagrant disregard, they're not held accountable. They cannot do that no more. So ones who actually care about life safety and keeping their systems up, this just goes into you know everyday business. So um, and again, so here's the phone number. So if you actually run into a system that gets impaired or uh, it's out of service for any reason, the phone number is listed here to for Phoenix Fire Alarm, uh, their alarm room to actually make that phone call. So if you are that designated representative who is going to be responsible for an impairment, notification is a part of it. So you might want to keep that number handy. And guys, when they did, when they did provide those reports, but you know, let's turn that over to the building owner, the property manager, and start working on the deficiency. That way, we don't have to incur fines. We don't want to incur any more costs on our owners. Uh, so when they provide that, let's start moving on. You know, and if you have questions, ask me, Dan. You know, get a hold of Chris. You know, look at so we can start working on stuff. So it's very important when they provide that building report. Too. Fantastic. So, and then again, depending on your guys' contract and how it's set up, if, if there's a not to exceed number, um, a lot of our guys carry small parts on the truck to where well, we can save, put in a non compliant tag, and write in a deficiency. We can add a sign to a door. Uh, we can change out gauges. We can do some of the things on site while we're there to eliminate these deficiencies and not even have a deficiency show up on the report. So that may be something that you can look at your contract and uh, discuss whether or not you have a not to exceed number um, and or get immediate approval for some of the repairs on site before we even leave. Four percent, awesome. And your guys are really good with you know giving costs like hey, hey, hey it's batteries or how much batteries? It's Fifty bucks. Put it in. Let's just get it done. That's what we're really good about. Great. Uh, well, this is the moment. Uh, Q&A, we hit the finish line, but before we depart, I'm really give you that opportunity to ask any questions. Anything, guys? What was your name again? Chris. Good to meet you, Chris. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Anything <laughs> um, else? Awesome. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys, online. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Yeah.